the Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, Astronaut, Astronaut, Take Up Thy Wrench. Eric Flint and Reiki Spore bond in a cage match after cutting up the remains of James H. Schmitz. Commandos of the Boer War and Home and Garden Improvement Show host with flamethrowers. Oh, can it be that dark matter is the new luminiferous ether? And part nine of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Coming up is a discussion with Eric Flint and Reich E. Spohr on their new science fiction novel, Portal. Now, this is the finale to the Boundary series by Eric and Reich, and it is a book with engineers and scientists for heroes and filled with wrenches and valves and ice planetoids with weird melting points and everything you'd want in a hard science fiction tale, including going deep sea diving on Jupiter's moon Europa. Brr. Speaking of cool things, we also have a reading suggestion from Bain author Dave Freer. And of course, we continue our complete serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom in audiobook form with Part 9. Now, Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. Hey, if there's one thing Bain Books is known for, it's giving away free stuff to get you hooked on our amazing authors and stories. We have the Bain Free Library. Uh, this is an ebook library at bainebooks.com. And every month on the 15th, like Celestial Clockwork, we post new short stories and nonfiction articles, all absolutely free at Bain.com. What's more, we collect these in ebook form and they remain free downloads for all eternity or at least until midnight at the Well of Souls. You know what that's a reference to, Laura? That's Jack Talker. Yeah. Have you read those books? I used to love those books when I was younger. They're on my to be read stack. Check them out. My favorite of those is Midnight at the Well of Souls. They're available, I think, at bainybooks.com. Uh, anyway, this month we have two free short stories and one science article. The science piece is by Bain author and NASA scientist Les Johnson. Dr. Johnson takes on the question of whether or not uh, non-baryonic dark matter even exists and what it might be. Have you seen any dark matter around the Bain offices, Laura? I think I found some in the cat's box the other day. Oh, no, wait, I'm thinking of Futurama. Oh, that's disgusting. What would dark matter look like? You think it would be all gothy? Gothy and stuff? emo. Yeah, we should call it emo matter. Uh, all right, very eerie stuff, dark matter. and uh, Perhaps necessary to explain the spin rate of the Milky Way also. We have a double bonus extra chocolate cream cookie of two great short stories this month, Laura. And what are they, Tony? Uh, one is a free elf home novella by Wynn Spencer. Wonderful story. This is set in Wynn Spencer's magically charged Pittsburgh of the Elf Home series. It's called uh, Pittsburgh Backyard and Garden. In Elf Home Pittsburgh, the home improvement show hosts have to carry around flamethrowers and large hand axes or risk not completing their segments due to death by carnivorous plants. Gotta watch those carnivorous plants. They'll get you every time. Yeah, especially the one with the with the tentacles. Also this month is a story by Dave Freer, set in the Heirs of Alexandria series, that is in a 16th century Constantinople where magic works. It's about an assassin who uses his own musicianship as a cover. He's a lute player, Laura. You like, you like those musicians. I do. Well... He's a Stone Cold killer, too, and, but he's got a problem. He really has a soft spot for dogs, for pooches, which leads to the classic problem of how to assassinate someone without taking out Fido. Pops up all across fiction. So go to Bain.com website and check out this great free stuff. While you're there, sign up for the Bain newsletter, which is usually put together by yours truly and copy edited by Laura. And mess around with our monthly contest as well. You might win something cool. And even if you don't, we really try to make these contests fun. So check all that out. 
Check it out at Bain.com. We want to welcome Eric Flint and Reiki Spore to the podcast. Joining me also this evening is Hank Davis, Bain Senior Editor Emeritus. Hi, sports fans. Is it Spore or Spore, Reich? Spore. Spore. Hi, guys. Nice to have you. Hi. Hey. Uh, Eric Flint is the author of scads of Bane books. They are like the stars, including his best-selling Ring of Fire alternate history series, which includes books like the series opener 1632, uh, recent books like 1635 The Papal Stakes, and 1636 The Kremlin Games, which is just out in paperback. Next month, Eric, uh, Mercedes Lackey and Dave Freer we talked to Dave last week but on the podcast, or a week before last. We'll team up again on their alternate history with magic, Heirs of Alexandria issue, Burdens of the Dead. I, t- I like just saying that title, Burdens of the Dead. But now we're here to talk <laughs> about uh, Eric and science fiction. Also with us is Reich E. Spohr, who is no stranger to science fiction himself. He's the author of debut novel Digital Night, which is not science fiction. It's urban fantasy, but... Uh, his next novel was the science fiction novel Grand Central Arena. The sequel to Grand Central Arena will be out this fall, Spheres of Influence. Reich is also the author of high fantasy adventure Phoenix Rising. Uh, for the past few years, Reich and Eric have been collaborating on the Boundary series of science fiction novels. Entries include Boundary and Threshold, and now we come to a big chapter in the series. That is Portal, which is now out in hardcover. Portal is science fiction with a definite emphasis on the science. Eric, uh, your first novel was Mother of Demons, a science fiction novel. So science fiction is clearly an area of interest for you. Can you tell us a bit about the origins of the Boundary series and how it came about and and uh, got going? Well, um, I got the idea a long time ago. Um, I, I, I've been interested in paleontology uh, basically my whole life, and I've always read a great deal on it, and I don't even remember exactly where I got the idea of having a encounter with an intelligent alien species take place not when humans and they were meeting at the same time, but when we discovered fossils of them uh, from millions of years earlier. And, and that's the central time, conceit of, uh, of the book, right? That's yeah. the central conceit of the of the, it's a trilogy, boundary, uh, threshold, and portal. And the central conceit is that these, one of the central characters, Helen Sutter, is a paleontologist, and in the course of doing a dig right at the KT boundary, which is the boundary layer between the Cretaceous and the Tertiary, um, she discovers a fossil that she eventually realizes is simply not human, not terrestrial, it can't be. Um, and given other evidence she finds with it, she concludes that they are intelligent, that they were intelligent. And then what happens later in the first book is that a the first expedition to Mars uncovers the remnants of an ancient alien base on the uh, moon of Phobos, and the people close to Helen figure out that that has to be the same species that left the fossils she found. That's how the story gets started. I had the idea many years ago, and I had it actually fairly well plotted out, but the problem was I'm not a scientist, and I don't have a a technical training in science. I'm interested in science. I've always read a great deal of popular science, but that's not the same thing as being able to actually write it. And I knew this had to be a real no-fooling, hard SF story to work. Um... So I kept postponing it because I knew the amount of research I would have to do. I was figuring that maybe one of the central characters had to be a rocket scientist um, on this expedition to Mars, and the amount of research I would have to do was just so daunting that I just kept pushing the book off. Then I ran into Reich, which is an interesting story in its own right, which we can get into later, and uh, once I learned Reich's background, he does have a scientific background. Now, in his case, it's an imaging, but I realized right away that by simply shifting the viewpoint character from being a rocket scientist to being an imaging specialist, that would take care of the problem and give us the uh, the hard science aspect we needed to uh, to make the story work. So I proposed to him to collaborate on the book, and um, 
and it went from there. And he scared the crap out of me. That's right. <laughs> so tell us, tell us the uh, the interesting meeting story. I'd like to hear that. Was, was that what he scared well, the crap out of one, you? Eric? Yeah, you go ahead, Rick. <laughs> well, way back in the the misty uh, days of uh, the beginning of this uh, millennium, uh, Bain was doing a reissue. It was the month uh, of April 2000, to be precise. Yes. <laughs> to be precise, yes. Uh, Bain was doing a reissue. That is the of, KT uh, boundary, isn't it? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the KT boundary. <laughs> oh, that's the income tax um, boundary. Oh. Bain was doing a reissue of Schmitz's work, and, um, of course, there was discussion on Bain's bar about it, and someone, I don't even remember who it was, but someone decided they were going to post a completely out-of-context segment of Eric's discussion of the work that he was doing on reissuing Schmitz. Um, I... Since I don't know who it is, I don't know if it was deliberately chosen just to be inflammatory, but I would guess it was, because it made Eric sound like he was going that he knew better than Schmitz how Schmitz should have written his own books, that he was going to edit Schmitz, and this is when I was younger and more naive about the way in which publishing went anyway. So, Schmitz, you have to understand, was one of my favorite SF authors. He's notable mostly in his era for the fact that he used very strong female characters who weren't treated as, quote, female. They were simply characters who happened to be female. Um, and anyone who's read Schmitz's work can see exactly what I mean by that. So anyway, I posted my feelings on who would, on someone who would edit a dead man's work and change it just so that it would be acceptable to modern audiences and arrogate themselves this position, blah, 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 blah. Um, this started a 2,000-plus post flame war on Usenet, um, because this was posted on Usenet, not on the bar, so we didn't have any of the context. All we had was this little segment. So Eric entered it, and uh, we went back and forth, and I think there were like 30 other participants as well. Um, somehow in the middle of this, while we both had uh, very differing opinions, we never actually insulted each other. Or when we did, we apologized for taking it personal. And both of us at one point or another said something that wasn't exactly accurate or or Mis or was misleading and immediately said, wait, no, that was wrong. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, that by itself on using it arguments is <laughs> unusual enough so that Eric came to at least regard me as though I might be an idiot, but at least it was an honest idiot. <laughs> so we arranged to get together, and to my surprise, he was not eight feet tall and, and with the pieces of other authors' works between his teeth. And uh, during our meeting, my wife brought up the fact, because I would never have dared do this myself, my wife brought up the fact that uh, I was uh, that I was an aspiring writer myself. So obviously he asked then what I wrote, and the only thing that I had available to send was what came to be called Digital Night. At the time it had the abysmal title of Morgantown, the Jason Wood Files. Uh, as I recall, what you said was something the, uh, on the uh, order of, normally I find uh, vampire novels as, wa as interesting in watching paint dry. Yes, and, but uh, but he took it, and some months later he called me up and uh, said that he actually found it eminently publishable stuff. That was a quote, and I was sort of floored by it because when he called me, I was sure he was going to try to let me down easy. Uh -huh. Well, um, Eric, would you like to rush him on? Like, uh, do you accept what Reich has said, or is uh, there any caveats? Pretty, yeah, said, yeah, the thing I found most uh, amusing about it was that. Um, if you want to sort of jumpstart your career as a writer, it, it's not usually considered proper to piss <laughs> off <laughs> the author that is going to wind up being your main sponsor and partner. But that uh, what's actually... the uh, by the way, what's the title of this uh, James Schmidt's uh, book that we're talking about? Well, there were four. What I did was I I, I wound up reissuing all of James Schmidt's writings in seven volumes. But um, and but the ruckus was over the first book, Tells the Amberton, which came out in April of 2000. That's when all the, the, the brawling started. We'll link to this, by the way, on the uh, podcast portion of the Baines Bar forum. And anyway, it, it, so that's how I got to know right. When he showed me eventually, the, the th he, what he'd done is he'd written three novellas that were related to each other. And I read them, and I was, uh, I was very surprised that they were very well written. I, I honestly wasn't expecting anything of that quality. I, I just kind of agreed to do it because I sort of felt, well, 
Okay, I should. Um, and I went to bat with Jim Bain for it. Um, Reich did rewrite it the way I recommended it. Um, Jim sort of liked it. Um, and, um, he wound up buying it. It was actually Jim who gave it the title, Digital Nine. Excellent. Uh, well, let's talk about Portal for a little bit. This is, like you say, the third book in the Boundary series, and it's, it's pretty much a complete, uh, novel in itself. We get a, pretty good rundown of the situation at the start of the book and then the action qu- kicks in pretty quickly and I felt like I was reading old analog magazines they were solving problems <laughs> you know or old Heinlein you know they're solving problems they're they're doing things um that you know with oxygen valves and wrenches <laughs> things like that um <laughs> There's a, a there's a bit of an intrigue plot in capturing some bad guys on Earth, but most of the action revolves around science and technology and um, things particular to the Jovian moon Europa. Uh, right? Can you tell us some of the background, the research and thought experiments, or, or Eric as well, uh, that went into this? <laughs> how that played into the story? Well, uh, this, yeah, this is Reich uh, speaking. Um, well. A lot of that, uh, it started, of course, with boundary. I mean, that was where I really had to do the heaviest part of the research. Um, because, as I said, when Eric proposed this to me, I sure as heck wasn't going to say no. I mean, it's a, it's an opportunity to, to collaborate with him on a real book on hard SF. But at the same time, I was terrified of the idea of doing hard SF because, well, I'd never really thought about doing it. I, I'm more a space opera and fantasy kind of guy. So I had to start out with boundary, and all right, I had the the uh, sensor um, knowledge. That was the uh, thing that I used a lot of in Digital Night and Diamonds Are Forever. And that uh, Eric said, "Oh, that's what I want in this. That's that's the kind of approach that I want." But I then had to research how spaceships actually worked versus get in and go after doing two weeks of of building something in your backyard, like any good. Uh, space opera adventure can do. Um, I had to research conditions on Mars and so on. For Europa, when I knew we were heading there, which was actually during Threshold, I uh, had to do all sorts of research on that. I've got one book by Richard Greenberg on Europa, the ocean moon, um, and I did a whole bunch of other research on it, just looking at the different theories. It's well known, or, or at least reasonably well accepted, that there is probably a liquid water ocean uh, under Europa's surface. Um, the, I, there's very little, if any, debate on it now. Um, but there's lots of debate on exactly how thick the ice crust is and how deep it is exactly and, and all the other characteristics of it. Um, other things I had to do, some of them I was you know, told to do by Eric or by others, uh, doing things like how do I shield from the radiation because inside the Jovian system there is just immense amounts of radiation yeah there's a lot of uh you really do some good stuff with the drama in the book about that because they have to worry about that all the time in the book and you and you really make you you know you made me tense as a reader worrying where they're going to get exposed at at various times well thank you Uh, thank you that that was an important thing to emphasize because jupiter's jupiter's magnetic field is so huge if you could see it if you looked in the night sky and you could see magnetic fields it would be bigger than the than the moon from this distance, um, and it basically captures all the radiation from the sun and accelerates it like a giant synchrotron. <laughs> so any of the inner moons are being constantly bombarded by ludicrous amounts of radiation, so they had to have a shield. Um, so I had to look into that. I had to look into what kind – is it possible there could be life under Europa's you know, ice, you know, because that would be an important plot point as to whether or not you could have it. Otherwise, you know, if you couldn't, then, you know, nobody would even talk about it. But if they could, they would certainly talk about it, given that they'd found these alien uh, remnants on several different uh, places. By the time of uh, Portal, they found bases on Mars, on Mars's moon Phobos, and on the uh, moon Ceres, on the, on the asteroid Ceres, and a strong indication that there's one on uh, Enceladus, one of the moons of Saturn which is, in fact, where they were going when the disaster 
happens that causes them to get crashed. Right. They are stranded. The, the, the crew is stranded on Europa at this point, and, this, and, and most of the book is about trying to figure out how they're going to save themselves as well as doing science and, and exploring. Yes, and uh, I was, and I believe uh, Eric was, shooting for um, the tone of Arthur Clarke and Heinlein's um, old juveniles, his be- the best of his juveniles, and that kind of thing. That was the kind of tone I was going for. I wanted something that was uh, upbeat for, you know, in, in the general sense of, you know, humanity and everything, but that had tension, not mostly from human conflict. There's really only one human conflict in all three books in the sense of violence, and that's in Threshold, the middle book. Um, all the others, there's really no human you know, physical conflict, nobody's fighting or shooting at each other or anything like that. The conflict all comes from the fact that you're up against a universe that doesn't care about you and for the most part is not meant to uh, for human beings to survive in. So you need to use everything you've got to get through what we would find on Earth to be trivially simple tasks. As you said, you know, the radiation. Uh, here, we step out the door, we go and we go for a walk. There, if you don't have the shield up, you step out the door and go for anything more than a couple of minutes walk, you're already dead, even if you don't feel it yet. Another thing that you that is in Portal that you don't see in a lot of fiction is um, functional married couples as characters, which I really found refreshing. <laughs> uh, Madeline Fathom, uh, who's the team leader, used to be a spy on Earth. She's married to another character uh, who's, who's – that's Joe Buckley, right, Mr. Troubleshooter? And, it is indeed Joe Buckley. Yeah. Well, the famous Joe Buckley. Who has a that name has a history in uh, in Bane books, does it not? A <laughs> long in history the, in, <laughs> in the, Well we, Joe Buckley is a is a is a real person. He's a, a, a Bane reader and uh you know, he's a fan and also over the years has become friends with a number of authors and I don't actually know where it got started. There are two or three different stories, and I'm not sure which one of them is true. But but tradition developed where authors kill off Joe Buckley. Um by now, a number of Bane authors have done it. I've killed them off twice in uh, in the 1632 series. Uh, I killed them off in Galileo Fair, and then I also killed off a different Joe Buckley, but same name, in a, in a short story I wrote. And then when Rank and I started working on Boundary, I, you know, by then, I don't know, David Weber killed them off. I think John Ringo's killed them off. I mean, I've forgotten the whole time. He's been, uh, yeah, I mean, he's been killed off a lot of times, and often in a very gruesome manner. So what I proposed to Reich was that we'd switch around a little bit and have Joe almost get killed over and over again, but he always manages to survive. Um, and that remains true with the books out now. That That is true all the way through the end of the trilogy. He, he manages to survive. In fact, the original draft of Portal, the last line, was something... Joe Buckley saying, I can't believe I'm still alive, but <laughs> our publisher made us take it out. <laughs> she said, I am, so, I am so tired of that itch. <laughs> Too much self-reference, maybe. <laughs> but he is still alive at the end of it. Um, yeah. the, real Joe Buckley, anyway, by the, the real Joe Buckley, by the way, is going to be fan guest of honor at HonorCon this fall. So, in, oh, is uh, really? I'm going to be at, I'm going to be at HonorCon also. Um, I did want to say I'm glad that you uh, noticed about the the functional married couples because that is one of the things I wanted to make sure that was was clear in there. I mean, A.J. Baker, the censor genius who's still trying to be an infant at uh, uh, thirty, um, and Helen Sutter um, would seem to be a very odd couple, but they're a very stable couple because she exactly compliments him in many ways, and he recognizes it and makes use of her to back him up. Um, and the same thing is true of Madeline. Madeline Fathom is an omnicompetent. She is the closest to a, to a true space opera character sitting in this ordinary SF world. Um, and one would think that she is just better than everyone else, but she also knows she needs somebody to give her an anchor to the regular world. And she's chosen Joe Buckley because Joe is the most stable and uh, responsible person that she's ever met, and the one who is by far the most patient and understanding and exactly what she needs. And the, and he, on the other hand, can rely on her utterly to back him up on anything that needs to be done. So, And 
they all together have all these skills that allow them to survive along with the other people. I mean, there's a total of 13 people in the uh, shipwrecked group of Europa. Um, and together they do eventually manage to get home, which is, uh, which does require some juggling. I mean, I, to be honest, this is the, one of the things that anyone who's reading an SF book has to recognize is that, I mean, this is something that Eric emphasized to me at times, to remember that in the end, the story takes precedence over science. So sometimes there are places in there where I know that I'm, I've bent the laws of physics to the point that there's no reasonable way that that's going to happen. I can justify it in text and I can wave my hands, but really it's not going to happen. But it was necessary for the story. And if people ask, I'll tell them which parts. <laughs> um, but uh, I try to still make it so that it's believable that they could do this, even if it isn't really reasonable. Well, I think it's very, uh, it's very, I mean, you've certainly got the plausibility down in, in this one. Um, and, by the, and let's talk a little bit more about the science. Uh, it, there's a surprise in Portal we don't want to reveal here, but the ships have crash-landed on the ice moon of Europa, like like we've been talking about. Um, in creating the Bimis, this, uh, this alien uh, species that's been discovered that was on Earth at the time of the dinosaurs, and other hypothetical alien species... Uh, what was the biological thinking that went into this? Um, I know, Eric, you said you have a background in biology. If you, uh, did the... Well, I, it's not a background, just a long-time interest. The only thing I developed was a, um, I needed to figure out how, what kind of remnants of a body of an alien would would, would fossilize. So they had to be hard parts. And but would do so, would, but would be clearly non-terrestrial. So the eventually the um, what I came up with was a sort of quasi skeleton, nothing really a skeleton, a quasi skeleton of of plates. They're not bones; uh, they're more like armor plates um, that that articulate and slide back and forth. Um, they don't. They literally the limbs just simply don't work the way. Um, uh, terrestrial animals do. I believe it's functional. I, no one will know because no one's ever seen an animal move like this. But um, but that's as far as I ever took. I didn't even try to visualize. As I recall, Rick, I hadn't visualized the exactly what they'd look like. I think you're the one that came up with that. Yeah, I think was, the only it, thing we talked about was that it would be a that they'd be a kind of a tripartite uh, structure. But I believe you're the one who came up with the actual body plan, if I remember right. The only thing um, I came up with was the, uh, the, you know, the, the way the, the skeleton, the sort of pseudo skeleton will work. Uh, yes, that's, uh, that's basically right, Eric. You also specifically described the little, the shoehorn, uh, yeah, shaped right. pieces, yeah. Yeah. which were the key to discovering Bemi in the first place. Right. Uh, because they were, as, as you said, this is something where you looked at it, and uh, in the, in Boundary, we have the conversation where they're all looking at it and, uh, Joe, who at the time is doing some paleontological um, judgment, says, well, it could be a – well, no, but then if you – and they go through several cycles of trying to figure out what it is and realizing that whatever it is, it's not anything that they can quite put a finger on. Um, but, yes, um, I I thought about the, uh, the, the, the logic that uh, Eric had come up with. So we had a three a trilateral symmetry. And we wanted something that would look alien and that would use these sliding members. So I had something where its motion is going to be sliding, pulling things in and extending them, pulling things in and extending them. How is it going to move, especially on land? I mean, in water, it's, it's easier to move things around in many ways. But on land, we had to think about it. So eventually, me working, me and my uh, wife working together, because my wife has great, a great interest in paleontology and uh, – is also something of an artist. And she actually has a degree in fine art, as well as uh, has done a lot of illustration on her own. We just worked together back and forth trying to figure out what this thing would look like, and eventually we came up with the sketch that's in Boundary, um, where basically this thing sort of crawls on extendable elbows on uh, two of its three limbs that it can extend. And the limbs themselves branch, um, you know, they bifurcate several times, in order to give it multiple digits that it can manipulate with at the end. So it's sort of like 
arms that are sort of ending in bushes, sparse bushes, but bushes. And that was actually taken, in, in my mind, when I came up with that plan, it was actually taken from a sketch of an alien that I drew when I was a, a kid in high school, um, it was the, which I did basically by just building its, its entire body plan by branchings and bifurcations. And I thought, I can use that. I can use that basic concept. And so that's where the basic design came from. Uh, the other, like they find examples of life forms that uh, the Bemis had brought with them in a series, and those are all derived from similar things. In terms of the biology itself, one can argue in both directions as to whether or not you could ever actually have compatible biologies. I think it's a lot more fun to imagine that they are, uh, simply because that opens you up to a lot more uh, story possibilities than if you have all biologies incompatible with each other. Then basically you can't live on any other world except yours or the ones that you wipe out all the native life and replace it with your own. Yeah, that that is a um, – it's actually a real issue that, that often gets ignored in science fiction. I dealt with it in my first novel, too. Um uh, and actually, I came up with, I think, as far as I know, a unique solution to the problem. I don't know of any other novels that have ever done it. But um, but it was the same basic problem of, of uh, and we don't know because we've never, we have no experience with it. But, you know, could you eat the food, assuming you can find another planet of life on it, could you eat the food? And if you could, without, you know, being poisoned, would it give you all the nutrients you need? Um, probably not. There's probably, probably you can eat some of it, and you get some benefit, but probably, I don't know. It'll, 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 it's one of these things, which, by the way, is true in a number of areas when we wrote this book, that you just don't know. One thing, for instance, that, that I hadn't realized until we started working on the book, I'd sort of known this was important, but I hadn't realized how centrally important it is, is if you're talking about long space voyages, it's a problem of microgravity, um, Mm. which early science fiction just completely was oblivious to. In fact, actually, the tradition was that that, that zero gravity would be good for you and that people would live longer because there'd be less stress on their bodies. And In fact, the other way around, the human body was evolved to for a gravity environment and we don't handle microgravity well at all and there are real long-term health problems if living in weightlessness or close to weightlessness and the only real solution that exists unless you posit some kind of artificial gravity and at that point you're bordering on fantasy is basically you have to use centrifugal force um as the only way you can create a kind of artificial gravity on board a spacecraft. And in order to do that, you need a pretty big ship. Uh, there's no way around it. Or you need something kind of awkward like a, a small ship that's that's got a counterweight at the end of a long cable and you spin it around, but that creates its own set of problems. But one of the things that happened when we were doing this, we, we did discuss the issues with several you know real rocket scientists, and we asked them what, how high does gravity have to get in order to counteract the, uh, the, the the health problems with microgravity? And the answer was nobody knows. Nobody really knows because we haven't done it. Um, and so we guessed that one-third Earth gravity would probably be good enough, but well, we won't know if we're right until somebody actually goes to Mars <laughs> and we find out. We just don't know. Well, it's uh, perhaps a uh, some young like yeah, perhaps some young reader will that will form a hypothesis that in their mind when they when they read this book and they'll they'll want to find it out and they might find it out just because they uh, they've been thinking about it since they were a kid when they read Portal. I'd love that. Well, thank you both. The book is Portal, and it is straight down the line science fiction. It's book three in the Boundary Science Fiction series by Eric Flint and Reiki Spore. Portal is in hardcover right now at booksellers everywhere. So thank you, Eric Flint and Reiki Spore, for joining us. All right. Thank you. Thank you. We we like to ask some of the amazing people in the Bain Books community for a weekly reading suggestion for our listeners. This time we've got Bain author Dave Freer with us. Hi, Dave. 
Hi, guys. Dave Freer is the author or co-author of many books, novellas, and short stories for Bane and beyond. His latest is High Fantasy Dog and Dragon, which is part of the Dragon's Ring series and is out in mass market. Dave is also the co-author of books in several series with Eric Flint and with Eric Flint and Mercedes Lackey, the Heirs of Alexandria series, including newest entry Burdens of the Dead. Dave, I believe you have a weekly reading suggestion for us. What might that be? Okay, there's, there's a lot of interest in, in the Bayan community in military SF, military history, and there's quite a lot of interest in fantasy, which involves, well, horses, mobile guerrilla warfare, combat, that kind of thing. And I thought, well, instead of suggesting a fantasy or science fiction story, I would give you one of my source books, which um, I've used to, to help me to get a handle on how to write about combat and about the rigors of being at war. And that is a book called Commando. That's C O M M A N D O. And it's by Denais, which is D E N E. Y S Rates R E I T Z. Now Denise Rates was the son of a, a farmer who at sixteen volunteered to join the Boer commandos um, to fight against the British um, in the Boer War. He spent the, the Boer War fighting with various commandos which were Groups of farmers armed with what they had and the skills they had and the horses that they had at home, uh, fighting what was at the time the most powerful and well-organized empire on, on earth. And it's a fascinating and very evocative read because this is asymmetric war as written from the side of the underdog. Now, if you think about it, most science fiction and fantasy stories end up being written from the side of the underdog. And this is a great source of what it really was like. And the nice thing about Denae Straits is that he's a very simple, very clear, very unemotional in some ways, but writing about this incredibly tragic and incredibly difficult um, war between people who often, well, I mean, my own mother and father are, are from opposite sides of, of that particular war. And it, it's just a fantastic read. Excellent. So that is uh, Commando by Denise That's Rates. It. Excellent. Denise Rates. We, we are talking about three or four thousand troops in, in the field, really. Um, against the British Empire. And at one stage, it almost looked like they could win. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just asymmetric warfare being carried out on ground that they really knew against an enemy who was trying to fight a war um, the way he'd always fought it back in Europe. And it just didn't work in Africa. I think that's something that the uh, the band community will love. Okay, take care. And now we continue with our most excellent audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you are not an Audible subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible free for 30 days. I'm a longtime subscriber and enjoy the service a great deal. Okay, here's what has gone before. The scattered systems of the Talbot Quadrant are now allied with Honor Harrington's Dark Kingdom of Manticore, but trouble is brewing on the border between the Talbot Quadrant and the ancient crumbling Solarian League. We open on Halkirk, a planet in the Luma system, under the thumb of the autocratic Sollies. The planet's bloodthirsty, tyrannical rulers are in cahoots with Solarian League interests to bleed the system dry 
of natural resources while keeping the inhabitants under the boot hill of a local dictatorship. Several worlds on the quadrant boundary are in similar straits. As the Solarian League crumbles, planetary rebels try to break the Sali hold on their systems. Some of these rebels are receiving aid from a mysterious stranger who claims to work for Manticore. The problem is, he actually works for the Mason Alignment, a secret organization that would like nothing more than to see the Solarian League and the Star Kingdom at one another's throats. Meanwhile, Royal Manticoran Navy Admiral Michelle Hankey, Countess Goldpeak, sympathizes with the rebels and wants to help, but she lacks the resources for full-scale conflict, yet. Goldpeak knows that you don't poke the Empire without it poking back. What she wants is to pick her own time and place to confront the Sollies, however, because when Goldpeak fights, she fully intends to win. Here is Part 9 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. So, that's about the size of it, on the housing side at least. Henry Kreitzman looked around the governor's house conference room in the planetary and quadrant capital of Thimble and shrugged. It's only been seven weeks since O'Cleary's surrender, so despite Admiral Bordelon's protests, we're actually doing pretty damned well, I think, especially considering the fact that we're not the ones who went and invaded their star system. Surely you don't expect Bordelon to admit that, do you, Henry? Baroness Medusa observed tartly. Most of the people seated around the long table grimaced, but she had a point. With Admiral Keeley O'Cleary's departure for Old Chicago and the deaths of Admirals Sandra Crandall, Dunichi Laszlo, and Griseldas de Gauci in the Battle of Spindle, Admiral Margot Bordelon had inherited command of the surrendered personnel of SLN Task Force 496. Judging from her own conversations with Bordelon, Michelle Hankey was confident the Solarian officer would have declined the honor if she'd had any choice. Any impartial board of inquiry would have to conclude that Bordelon bore no responsibility for what had happened to Crandall's task force. She might not have covered herself with glory, but Michelle doubted any battle fleet flag officer was likely to have accomplished that. As far as the battle itself was concerned, Bordelon had done precisely what she'd been ordered to do— and she'd conducted herself in punctilious accordance with the Deneb Accords since becoming senior officer of the Solarian POWs, none of which was likely to cut any ice where the consequences to her career were concerned. As TF-496's two surviving senior officers, she and O'Cleary could pretty much count on being scapegoated for the deceased Crandall's mistakes, unless their own family connections were lofty enough to avoid that fate. It seemed unlikely they could be, in O'Cleary's case, since she'd been the one to actually surrender to the handful of cruisers which had ripped Crandall's SDs apart, but there might be some hope, career-wise at any rate, for Bordelon. After all, she wasn't the one who'd cravenly, to use what appeared to be the Solly Newsfax editorial's favorite adverb, although gutlessly seemed to be running a close second and pusillanimously was clearly in contention as well, at least for newsies with impressive vocabularies, surrendered. And she obviously intended to be as inflexible as possible in demanding Manticore meet the Deneb Accords' obligations to properly house, feed, and care for prisoners of war. The fact that there were the next best thing to half a million of those prisoners, and that they'd arrived with absolutely no warning, couldn't mitigate those obligations in any way as far as Bordelon was concerned. She not only repeated her demands for adequate housing at every meeting with any of Medusa's or Kreitzman's representatives, but insisted her protests against her personnel's mistreatment be made part of the official record. Clearly, she hoped her demands that her people should be properly treated and the clear implication that they weren't being would produce the image of a decisive flag officer refusing to buckle before the brutality of her captors, despite the situation she faced through no fault of her own. Michelle liked to think she would have had more on her mind than career damage control in Bordelon's place. In fairness, though, she had to admit there wasn't a lot else for Bordelon to be worrying about at the moment, particularly since the Solarian knew perfectly well that Medusa and Kreitzman were doing everything humanly possible to see to her people's well-being. And it wasn't as if any of the Solarians were actually suffering— 
The islands Prime Minister Alcazar had designated as POW camps were all located in the planet Flax's tropics. With the moderating effect so much ocean exercised on temperature, those islands came about as close to having perfect climates as was physically possible. That might change during hurricane season, but hurricane season was months away, and proper housing and other support facilities were being constructed at an extraordinarily rapid pace. Yes, the majority of Bordelon's personnel were still under canvas, yet that was changing quickly, and not even Bordelon could complain about the food or the medical attention. No, I don't suppose I should expect her to admit it, Kreitzman said now, in response to Medusa's comment. Doesn't make me any less tempted to wring her neck every time she opens her mouth, though. Kreitzman's Dresden accent was more pronounced than usual, and Michelle wondered if that was intentional. As the Quadrant's Minister of War, he was directly responsible for the coordination, maintenance, and management of the various planetary militias and the Quadrant Guard Local Defense Force, organized under the Quadrant's constitution. It was a new departure for Manticore, but some of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention had argued in favor of a locally raised and maintained military force to serve as backup for the Royal Navy, and the Grantville government had agreed to it. For one thing, it would ease the burden on the Navy and the Royal Marines considerably. The Quadrant would also be responsible for maintaining the Quadrant Guard out of local tax revenues, which would prevent it from becoming a charge on the Imperial Treasury. And finally, Grantville's agreement had recognized the unspoken truth that the maintenance of a local force would help Talberters sleep more soundly at night. Not only would it ensure that OFS wouldn't come calling while the rest of the Star Empire was distracted elsewhere, but it had been something of a sop to any local fears of manti tyranny from the old Star Kingdom's direction. At the moment, however, it was Kreitzman's guard which had responsibility for security where the POWs were concerned. That was enough to make Bordelon's protests especially irritating to him all by itself, but that particular irritation wasn't by itself. For some odd reason, TF-496's unprovoked onslaught on their capital system hadn't made Talbotters in general any fonder of Solly's, and Dresden's hatred for all things Solarian had burned hotter than most to begin with. I trust you haven't been as forthright with Admiral Bordelon as you are with our cabinet colleagues, Henry? Minister of the Treasury, Samiha Lavabibi said dryly, and Kreitzman snorted a laugh. No, I haven't, he said. Yet. Then we all have something to be grateful for, Prime Minister Alcazar observed. Alcazar, by far the tallest person seated at the table, turned to Admiral Augustus Kumalo. And while Henry's doing his best to leave Bordelon's neck unrung, I believe you had something you and Admiral Goldpeak wanted to bring up, Admiral? And which you would prefer to discuss rather than Minister Kreitzman's relationship with Admiral Bordelon, Mr. Prime Minister? Kumalo responded innocently. Kumalo was a full head shorter than Alcazar, but the planet of San Miguel's gravity was only 0.84 g. For all his height, Alcazar looked almost frail beside the considerably more massive Kumalo. Admiral, I'd rather discuss almost anything rather than Henry's relationship with Bordelon, the Prime Minister said emphatically, and Kreitzman grinned. Then Alcazar's expression sobered. And, all humor aside, the truth is that at the moment, the disposition of our naval forces is more important than just about anything else we could be discussing. Kamalo nodded, then glanced at Michelle before he turned back to the other people at the conference table. Since Admiral Goldpeak is the commander of our mobile forces, I'll let her address the specifics of your question, Mr. Prime Minister. Before she does, though... I'd just like to emphasize that she and I have discussed this situation exhaustively, both between ourselves and with our squadron commanders, and with Minister Kreitzman and the members of his staff as well. I don't think anyone's genuinely satisfied with the deployment stance we've come up with, but, under the circumstances, 
I believe it's the best available to us. He looked around the attentive faces, then back at Michelle. Milady. Thank you, sir, Michelle replied with rather more formality than had become the norm between her and the man who commanded Talbot Station. Then it was her turn to look around the table, making eye contact with the men and women responsible for the quadrant's governance. Essentially, she began, our problem is that while Admiral Kamalo and I believe we've decisively demonstrated our combat superiority, we simply don't have enough hyper-capable units to cover the entire quadrant. I doubt anyone back at Admiralty House is any happier about that than we are, although I'll grant our unhappiness has a little more immediacy than theirs does. Unfortunately, I don't see any way the deployment priorities are going to change any time soon. Given the combination of what's happened to the home system, the fact that we have no reason to believe at this time that the Sollies have an additional force anywhere near the size of Crandall's in our own vicinity, and the activation of Case Laocoon, there simply aren't any more ships for the Admiralty to send our way. So we have to make do with what we have, and while neither Admiral Kumalo nor I like that situation, it's one Queen's officers have had to deal with more often than we'd like to remember. After careful consideration, we've concluded that the best use of our current forces will be to cover each system of the quadrant with four or five lax squadrons for local defense, backed up by a couple of dispatch boats. The lax should be more than adequate to deal with any pirate stupid enough to come this way, and given what we've seen of SLN technology, they also ought to be able to deal with any Sali raiding force that doesn't include a core of capital ships. Given Crandall's losses, it's unlikely there are enough Solarian capital ships anywhere near the quadrant to provide that kind of force. Obviously, that's subject to change, possibly without much warning. But even in a worst-case scenario, the local defense lax should be able to at least delay and harass any attackers while one of the dispatch boats goes for help. I realize there has been some thought of splitting up our own capital ships in order to give our star systems greater protection. She carefully didn't look in the direction of the two men sitting on either side of Samiha Lababibi. Antonio Clark, from the Mainwaring System, was the Quadrant's Minister of Industry, while Clint Westman, a Montanan cousin of the famous or infamous Stephen Westman, headed the Ministry of the Interior. On the face of it, they should have been almost as unlikely allies of an oligarch like Lababibi as Kreitzman once had been, but the nature of their responsibilities gave them a certain commonality of viewpoint. Inevitably, all three were worried, deeply, about what would happen if the Quadrant star systems were hit by anything like the Yawata strike. Westman and Clark, especially, had argued in favor of dispersing Tenth Fleet to give every star system at least some protection. After all, they'd pointed out, the decisive superiority of the Manticoran Navy had been conclusively demonstrated— so the traditional risks of defeat in detail for dispersed units must be less applicable than usual. Lababibi had found herself in the same camp, although she'd been a rather less fervent spokeswoman for their position. There are several reasons we're not proposing to do that, Michelle continued. The two most important ones, though, are that dispersing our capital ships wouldn't provide any appreciable increase in system security against the sort of attack which hit the home system, but it would disperse the powerful, concentrated striking forces it's vital to maintain to respond to any fresh Solarian activity in our area. At the moment, the Admiralty and ONI are still working on how the Yawata strike was launched. From the information available so far, Admiral Hemphill is more convinced than ever the attack relied on a new, previously unknown drive technology— in effect, we believe the attackers were invisible to our normal tracking systems. So far, at least, no one's been able to suggest how whatever drive they used might work or how we might go about figuring out how to detect it in the future. In the meantime, however, analysis also suggests the attackers were probably operating in relatively small forces, relying on the cloak of invisibility rather than raw combat power. I realize that may sound absurd given the damage inflicted, but I assure you that if a single podnaught or even a couple of Nike-class battle cruisers had been able to get into range of the inner system totally undetected, that would have been ample to have inflicted all of that damage. My point is 
that the problem in Manticore wasn't lack of combat power or lack of defenses. It was the inability to see the enemy coming. Scattering wallers around the quadrant star systems isn't going to appreciably increase our ability to detect these people. We can deploy enough remote sensor platforms, in fact, we're already in the process of deploying them, to give each of our systems more detection capability than an entire squadron of SDs could provide. The LAX will give us large numbers of manned combat platforms to chase down and prosecute possible contacts. The dispatch boats will be available to send for help in the case of an attack in strength, and we'll be deploying enough missile pods in planetary orbit to provide the long-range missile firepower of at least a pair of SDPs in each system. We won't have the sort of sustained firepower Super Dreadnoughts could provide, or the area missile defense they could offer, but we'll have enough to deal with anything short of a Sali battle squadron, assuming we see it coming. She paused, and this time she did look across the table at Lava B.B. Clark and Westman. I believe those deployments will give us at least as much defensive depth as splitting up my wallers could accomplish. In addition, however, it will permit Admiral Kumalo and me to concentrate my hyper-capable units into two striking forces, each with a powerful lack element of its own. One will be deployed to Tillerman, the other will be based on Montana. Obviously, the Tillerman force will be closest to Monica and Myers, which would normally be the most probable threat axis where any fresh Solarian adventures were concerned. Frankly, though, at the moment, I'm not really very concerned about something coming at us out of the Madras sector, given the fact that we just polished off 70-plus super dreadnoughts that were stationed in that sector. It seems unlikely they have still more capital ships tucked away out here, even with Mesa and Manpower pulling every string they can reach. If the Sollies do decide they have anything else to spare and send it our way, it's more likely to come in direct from the core. That's why I'm planning on basing the second force at Montana to cover the Quadrant's flank, and the Lynx Terminus picket force will be available to cover any threat that might come in past Asgard. There are some arguments in favor of staying right here in Spindle instead of moving to Montana, given Spindle's more central location within the Quadrant, but so far, Admiral Kamalo and I don't find them persuasive. To be honest, our objective is to get sufficient combat power, enough combat density deployed across a broad front, to permit me to respond quickly to dispatches from the star systems behind me while simultaneously positioning me to operate offensively into Sali and Mason space, if that should become desirable. She saw one or two sets of eyes flicker at the reference to Mesa. Not everyone in the quadrant endorsed her own suspicions of Mesa and Manpower Incorporated. It wasn't that anyone questioned Manpower's involvement in what had happened at Monica and New Tuscany, nor did anyone in the quadrant doubt Mesa's and Manpower's implacable and thoroughly reciprocated a hostility towards the Star Empire. More than one of the people sitting around that table, though, remained of the opinion that frontier security and possibly other interests within the League had been using manpower as a cat's paw. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 9, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com. Thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Hank Davis, and March to the Stars composer Ruth Judkowitz. Laden jars of hair-raising vitreous positive charge to Dave Freer and to our portal authors Eric Flint and Reich E. Spore. Please join us next time here at the pounding heart of science fiction and fantasy and keep reaching for the stars. The stars.